Can I preach a little bit? Can I preach a little bit? Uh, we're going to go into this new series uh, as we try to set the tone and trajectory for our year. And before I even give you any title, before I even give you any text, I just want you to know that I genuinely believe that this series over the next six or seven weeks uh, is not just something I'm preaching to you. It's something that preaching to us. Uh, it is a series that I have taken quite personally through the latter half of last year. And I felt very much so my own convictions and my own encouragements and my own challenges and my own uh, uh, exposures as I have worked through uh, the content of the next six or seven weeks. And uh, we'll be preaching going through the book of James is one of my favorite books of the Bible because of its practicality, uh, because of its frankness and its candor. Uh, and so we're going to be in this series. I already call pressure points, pressure points, practical wisdom from Jesus's little brother. Some of y'all like Jesus had a brother. <laughs> we go, this is going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Uh, pressure points. And I'm going to talk a little bit about pressure in just a second, but it is vitally important that we manage pressure effectively in all of our lives. I don't care who you are in this room. We all have some pressure that we experience. How we manage it and how we process it determines the pain or the amount of promise that we carry. Say it again. The way we process and manage pressure determines the amount of pain or the amount of promise that we carry. And as we prepare for our year, I believe that today is going to lay a foundation uh, for what is to come. Now, I do want to make sure I say this. Today is a day of laying foundation. I'm going to teach a lot. This is a note-taking day. But this is going to be a great opportunity for us to, again, set the foundation for what our year will bring. So let's go to the book of James, chapter 1. The book of James, chapter 1 in the NIV version. Now. As you prepare to read this, let me go ahead and, 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 and give y'all the shock of the day. Y'all ready? We're going to read through the entire chapter today of James 1. I know some of y'all was like, I knew I picked the wrong day to come to church. This is some stuff. And I'm going to tell you why. Because as we walk through James in this series, what you're going to find is that James is a book, chapters 2 through 5, where he absolutely outlines in grave detail these elements and lessons that we all can take and apply readily to our daily lives. However, in James chapter 1, because he knows he goes through all of this detail in chapter 2 through 5, James knowing that we would be a generation, and even back then, you know, we don't like to read the whole thing. You know, we need a trailer. We need something to get us going. He, in chapter 1, gives a summary or an overview. I like to say he gives a trailer to the feature film. He gives you the fragment he gives you the idea of here's what I'm going to touch on and cover for the next three, four chapters so that we can know what to expect. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to go through the trailer. We're going to go through this overview that he provides in James chapter 1 that kind of sets the tone uh, about what kind of expectations we can have uh, as we go through the rest of this series to continue to grow in our year. But James chapter 1, verse 1, it says this, James, a servant of God. In the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered, somebody say scattered, yes. among the nations, I bring greetings. Now, this is very critical right from the start because it identifies to us uh, who James is writing to. James is writing to a scattered people, a people who have dealt with a lot of stress and strain as of late as the Christian community. This is one of the first Christian churches ever created, and they have now, under immense persecution, found themselves now running, hiding, and scattered. And so James is writing this letter to that demographic of people. He goes on to say in verse 2, here it is, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. I'm going to say that again. So that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I want to read this two verses really quick in the message translation, verses two through four. Hear it like this. Consider it a sheer gift 
friends, when tests and challenges come to you at all, uh, from all sides, you know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. Oh, man. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. We're going to read through the rest of this, but I think this sets the tone and the arc for our conversation today. And I want to preach from this sermon thought, uh, this first installment of the series, Walk This Way. Walk This Way. Lord, I pray now they not hear my voice or see my face, but only hear and see the voice and face of you that lives in me. I decrease as you increase. Have your way in these moments. In Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen. Walk this way. There are all types of pressure uh, that we all experience. Uh, for some of us, uh, we experience peer pressure at some point in our life. Peer pressure is a very real type of pressure. For some of us, we've experienced the pressure to perform. Uh, whether it's been vocationally, academically, athletically, you've experienced the pressure to perform. Uh, but today I'd like to call our attention to this idea of pressure points. Pressure points can be defined anatomically and biology, bi biologically as an area that is sensitive to the touch. And depending on how the touch is applied, it can either cause pain and discomfort and or can be used for therapeutic purposes, depending on who's doing the touching. It, it is a pressure point. It is an area of sensitivity that can carry great pain or carry great promise. In addition to that, though, if we go beyond the biological definition, we find pressure points are those sensitive or crucial areas of our life that if under persuasion or pressure can produce a desired outcome. We see this in politics or in friendships or in relationships or in conflict. Some people around you know your pressure points. Can I get an amen right there? They know what to say, what buttons to push, what not to do, what face to make to get under your skin to produce a desired result. Some of y'all, y'all know y'all boss know y'all pressure point. You got a coworker, you be like, I'm just praying for strength in 2020, Vernon, that they don't get on the last pressure point I got. Pressure points. These are the areas of our life that can carry, once again, great promise or pain. And watch this, our ability to understand the necessity of pressure points and understand how to properly process pressure is significant to the type of life we live. Here's why. Because we will always mistakenly attribute pressure to an enemy when sometimes God is using it as an asset to your progress. If we don't know how to properly process pressure, pain, struggle, strain, we will always identify it as an enemy and not an asset. We will always blame it on a devil and not a God who sees our intended or desired outcome and says, I know the only way to get you to the promise is to take you through a process. It is in this that we find our writer today, James, talking to us. Now, if we're going to understand the book of James, I got to do a little teaching today. Can I teach you a little bit today? I was going to do it anyway, so we're going to do it. We're going to go to yeah. here's, here's, I want to talk to you about and teach you a little bit about James, who he is, who he's writing to, and why this is significant. We find James here, and here is James. James is Jesus' half-brother. Not to be confused with James, one of the original apostles. James, you might have heard mentioned, is one of uh, Jesus' inner circle friends as a disciple. And this is not the same James. This is a different James. James, who has now risen to leadership and power in the first Christian community of Jewish culture. Now he has risen to the leadership ranks as Peter, one of the original apostles, has now departed to go plant and lead other churches. So we find James, Jesus' little brother, 
rising to leadership of this influential, significant Christian community, again, at the departure of one of the original apostles. But it's significant to note, Jesus' half-brother was not one of the original apostles. That'll preach right there. For 20 of you who felt overlooked in 2019, you felt like, I just don't understand why God doesn't have my best interest at heart. I just don't understand why God is not making a miracle for me. Even Jesus didn't pick his own little brother to be a part of the original 12. Not because he wouldn't eventually be used. He just needed to be used in season. Some of y'all, that's the encouragement you needed. I haven't been overlooked. I'm just out of season. And here is James, Jesus' little brother, stepping up to lead this community of Christians. It's important to note, though, if we're just going to dive a little deeper in our study, that James is really not the accurate translation of Jesus' brother's name. In the Greek, this word is Yaakobos. Yaakobos. In the Hebrew, this word is Yaakov. Yaakov. Somebody say Yaakov. We're going to learn a little Hebrew today. And those words are both translated, not James, but Jacob. But just like in American culture, you know, we translate things and we make them easy for us. But the truth of the matter is the original translation and the more accurate foretelling of who he is is not James, but Jacob. So if you hear Jacob, understand that we're using that phrase and language interchangeably throughout this series to be integral to his authentic name and identity. So here is James, a.k.a. Jacob's little brother. And it's important to note the two influences that Jacob carries. Jacob has two major influences. Number one, Jacob has grown up with his brother's teaching. He's grown up learning from his big brother, Jesus. He has been present at the times he taught. He was able to glean and receive from his teaching directly. And so the first thing we need to understand is that that, that, that the writing of Jacob is heavily influenced by the teaching of Jesus, in particular, the Sermon on the Mount. He loves the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is the longest discourse by which Jesus ever preaches, is the longest teaching of Jesus' pastoral ministry. And the Sermon on the Mount sets a tone for most of the Christian theology for all of us as people. Well, what we need to understand is that James being impacted by this, rather Jacob, he recognizes, hey, I really want to make sure that I maintain the authenticity and the integrity of my brother's teachings. The people are scattered. They're stressed. And they're starting to wonder about what it is they should be doing and following. And so one of his motivations is to ensure, Sharice, that his brother's teaching does not get manipulated or mismanaged. So in in an effort to maintain the integrity of his brother's teaching, he writes this letter. In addition to that, you need to understand he's heavily influenced by the Old Testament wisdom book, Proverbs. James is heavily influenced by the book of Proverbs, which was considered the wisdom book of the Old Testament. Why is that significant? Because it frames and informs how you should read the book of James. When you read the book of James, you need to understand he's writing it to mirror the same way the book of Proverbs was written. When you read the book of Proverbs, there are these fragments of wisdom. He understood that that the, the, the readers at the time may not be able to read a whole book or a whole chapter like many of us. You know, we read a segment, but we won't read the whole chapter, you know, and so here he is trying to make sure that there is some information that can quickly be retained, recited, and reused. And so he writes in these fragments, and if you don't know that, you'll be reading James and be wondering why he's talking about one thing one second, and then he just jumps to another thing, and then he just jumps to another thing. He's still scattered in his writing. It's because he's not intending for you to try to read it all as one conglomerate book. He's writing it with the intention of you having these small pieces that you can pick out, recite, retain, and use as a a foundation for your life. I like to think about it like this. He's ludicrous. You know, Ludacris just had bars, but he really couldn't rap to me. I don't care what y'all say. But he had some great punchlines, didn't he? Boy, I tell you, you could just, you could listen to a whole Ludacris rap song and be like, this is horrible, but that was a good line that I can't get out my head. Here's James trying to be very intentional about the way he writes to ensure that we can retain. And the other few things you need to understand about the book of James. Number one, that it contains 12 practical teachings on wholehearted devotion to God. As I mentioned earlier, these are all contained in chapters 2 
through five. But what he does in chapter one is he's about to give us an overview, and we're about to walk through this trailer to the feature film. We're about to look at the areas by which James is going to cover in greater detail in two through five as he covers them in James chapter one. In addition to that, you need to understand that, uh, again, this is, again, the wisdom book or considered by many to be the wisdom book of the New Testament. So as he was influenced by Proverbs, he utilizes this place of writing to inform wisdom for New Testament theology. Last thing is this. You need to understand that Jacob is not writing to a specific church community. Rather, he is writing to the corporate Christian community and culture. Why is that significant? Because many times when you read New Testament theology, you need to understand when Paul writes to the church of Ephesus, he's writing to issues in Ephesus. When he's writing to the church of Corinth, he's addressing issues in Corinth. When he writes to the church of Philippi or the book of Philippians, he is addressing issues in the church of Philippi. And so it's important as a reader and as a disciple, when you read some of these things, you say, okay, what's the context? What's the conversation of the day? What's the conflict? What is happening? Well, James is not writing to any specific church community. James is writing to all us. James' intention is is to ensure that whether you are a Baptist Christian or an apostolic Christian, whether you're a Pentecostal Christian or charismatic Christian, whether you're a Kojic Christian or whether you're a Methodist Christian, that you all know how to integrally live out the teachings of his brother Jesus. And so he is making sure that this message is not compromise, so he is sending it and writing it so that every audience, even us today, can learn and readily apply the information shared. Can I get an amen right there? Now, this is all significant because now we find ourselves in this place where, okay, Vernon, we're looking at Jacob. He's writing this to us. Now, this is important to note. Now, Jacob is writing this to first century Christians. Now, first century Christians were not called Christians. They won't look at each other like, you are such a great Christian. Some stuff we kind of took on, and, and over time, we adopted that language and vocabulary. But first century Christians were identified or known as the way. Somebody say the way. Say it one more time. Say the way. Put quotes on it last time. Say the way. This is significant. This is so significant. They were known as the way because they placed a premium not on your words, but your ways. They placed a premium not on just your language, but your lifestyle. They placed a premium on not just the service you went to, but the way you served when you left. They placed a premium on the ways of living that would reflect the Savior they were following. It's significant because as we begin to think about Christian culture today, we have to be very careful that we do not affirm Christianity by our words when our ways don't match. That we not affirm one's measure of Christianity by the language that they have when their lifestyle has no indicators of who they serve. Here's the big idea for today. You ready? Because the way we live confirms the one we worship. The way we live confirms the one we worship. I'm going to make a bold statement today uh, at the uh, risk of offending or irritating some. Uh, so please charge it to my head and not my heart. But, but here's the truth. Here's the truth. I genuinely believe that we're in a day and time where a lot of us say we worship God. Our just social media page wouldn't affirm it. Mm-hmm. Come on here. We say we worship God, but the way we manage our money wouldn't. Confirm it. We say we worship God, but the way we manage conflict wouldn't confirm it. We say we worship God, but the way we cut somebody out one minute and sing Hillsong the next minute, y'all ain't going to say nothing today, would not confirm it. Because the way we live confirms the one we worship. And for many of us, we worship ourselves, and we worship our job, and we worship people, and we worship things, and we worship stuff. But when people look at the way we live, they would not know who we say we worship. So in this context, James is trying to help us to understand what it looks like to walk this way. What does it look like to really walk? like a wholehearted Christian. Now, before I get there, let me be very clear. Somebody might be asking in this room today, okay, Vernon, all oh, that's cute. Why should I care? Why, 
Why should I care? Here's why. Because this is why so many of us lack spiritual fulfillment. Here's why. Because we settle for a functional spirituality instead of a fulfilled spirituality. We settle for a functional spirituality, but not a fulfilled spirit. Have you ever had something that functioned, but it won't functioning at its full capacity? You ever had a friend with a phone that needed to be replaced a long time ago? And like they didn't drop it 82 times. They can't even swipe. <laughs> you be like, go ahead and do this with your phone. You got an iPhone, right? Yeah, yeah, but no, I can't swipe because I cut my finger. So I got to, uh, I can only use Siri to do everything. <laughs> They, they, they are making it function. It's just not functioning to its fulfilled purpose. Maybe you, you remember this back. I mean, I, I still, I, you know, I grew up living with my grandparents for a, a point in time. Uh, when I was going through chemo, I lived with my grandparents, and they still had one of those TVs with a hanger on it and some duct tape. Come on, anybody? Anybody know about hangers and duct tape? Come on, only a few of y'all. Oh, uh, Okay. Okay. It was functioning. They said, this will get the job done. But it wasn't fulfilling its full potential. I'll tell you one of the greatest examples of this in my life. One of the greatest examples of this in my life. True story, true story. Uh, uh, I was a youth pastor uh, uh, many years ago before we started church. And, 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 and I got a gift from one of the members of the church I was serving at as a youth pastor at that time. I got this gift. I got this gift. I was so excited because I had never really uh, played golf in a lot of years. I played when I was younger. But, but, but I hadn't played in a really long time. And so he gifted me with a golf bag. He gifted me with a golf bag. And I was hyped. I was hyped. I was like, oh, I'm about to get into my golf game. Because, ah. you know, golf is expensive. I couldn't buy no clubs. I was broke. And so, so I was very grateful that he invested into my life. And Frankie, when he gave me these clubs, I was excited and I was ready to go to the course. I knew I wasn't going to be good. Any bad golfers in the room? Any bad golfers in the room? Come on. Yeah, let's play together. Me and you. Let's play together. We're going we gonna to go out together. All of our good golfers, put your hand up. Put it down. Amen. We don't want to talk to y'all. Uh, any top golf golfers? Where y'all at? Top golf. All right. There we go. All right. All right. All right. All right. Here's, here's the thing. I got gifted this set of clubs. And I was super hyped. I was super excited. And I was looking forward to going out to play golf. And so I go my first time out. But I hadn't really looked in the bag, Sharika. I get out there and I unveil my first set of golf clubs. And, and, and I was excited and started swinging some of the clubs. And then I recognized something. I was missing some pieces. I didn't have a driver or a putter. Now, for those who don't understand golf, the driver helps you get started. The putter helps you finish the hole. So I could hit a whole bunch of stuff, but I couldn't start. And I couldn't finish. <laughs> couldn't start. <laughs> couldn't finish. And, and that day, I recognized I did not have all that was necessary to actually complete or finish the thing I had come to do. So I ended up being relegated to just the range. Which means, watch this, I could experience some of the fun, but not the fullness of it. I got a chance to experience a piece of the game, but not the full potential of the game. Could I suggest to you that many of us live a Christian life similar to this? That we're experiencing a piece of what it has to offer, but not the full potential of the promise? That if we were to ever really dig into our faith, we would find that there's some peace that we've been outsourcing that God said, I can provide to that in my lifestyle that there's some joy that you've been looking at from over here, but I can provide that through my lifestyle. That there's some things in your life that you've been saying, hey, it just feels fragmented. feels like I'm pulling from here. I feel like I'm pulling there. I'm just not getting all that this is intended to do. And could it be because we just haven't learned to walk that way? It's in this reality that James is trying to make sure that we can live what one translation calls a wholehearted Christianity. A wholehearted Christianity. And so I want to walk through four things that I believe James applies pressure to in chapter 1 
to set the trajectory for what we're going to deal with for the next six to seven weeks. As we walk through these next six to seven weeks, we're going to look at the pressure that James applies to all of these areas. But in chapter one, he kind of gives us a foreshadowing of what we can expect from his writing. And so he challenges us to consider the way of our life in four areas. Here's number one. The first thing he challenges us to think about as we think about wholehearted Christianity is the way we experience pressure. He challenges us to consider the way we experience pressure. If we look at Verse 2 through 4 again, we saw the message translation says, Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come from you at all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced. Somebody say forced. Because guess this. Have you ever played a sport and been exposed? You ever played a sport and you hid behind a good team, and then all of a sudden you had to go one-on-one? And you were looking at the other person, and you knew, okay, I am about to be exposed. Everybody is watching. Everybody is looking. Everybody sees now my deficiencies. They see my defeats. They see the areas of my life or my game or my attitude or my heart that are undeveloped or unprepared. This is what the Bible is telling us. Jacob is trying to help us to understand. Do not be upset sometimes when tests and trials appear. They may not be intended to take you out. They may be intended to take you up text tells us that your faith life will be exposed or forced into the open and show its true colors. But don't try to get out of it prematurely. Let it do its work. I love what the King James Version says, the New King James Version. Watch this. The New King James Version says the same two verses like this. It says, my brother encountered all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces, cuss word right here, you ready? Patience. (laughs) Ha ha. Watch this. I'm going to say it again. Brandon, don't miss it. Know this. Count it all joy when you face various trials. Why? Because the testing of your faith produces what? But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect. Now, this needs to be made abundantly clear because the misunderstanding could be, okay, well, Vernon, I don't think I can be perfect. Jesus was the only perfect person. Jesus, Vernon, you can't possibly think that going through trials and tribulations are going to make me a perfect person. No, a more accurate translation of the word perfect there is wholeness and integrity. The word perfect there in the Greek literally means wholeness and integrity. It's a term meant to say when something is finished its process, it'll be whole and it will be true to its integral form. So in other words, here's what Jacob is trying to get us to understand. Jacob is saying, when you go through some tough situations, when you go through some stressors, when you go through some trials and tribulations, don't get too frustrated. What it could be producing is a wholeness and an integrity in you. But here's the problem. Here's the temptation. Here it is. I want you to see this. Fragile minds only see a problem, not a process. Say again. Fragile minds only see a problem, not a process. So what happens is you get offended and then you run away because you saw a problem. You didn't see a process. Fragile minds see a a, a moment of difficulty or defeat and they avoid being re-exposed because now they see a problem, but they don't see a process. And when your mind is too fragile, you'll run away from opportunities that God is using to develop you to your full potential. Because you'll say, God, my preference is promise, but it's not process. But what God says is there's a guaranteed promise if you finish the process. So he says, don't run away, count it joy. When we get into next week's sermon, I'm going to preach specifically over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'm going to be using this idea of pressure burst pipes, and then I'm going to use a pressure cooker. Y'all ain't saying nothing here today. Somebody going to eat some food next week. We're going to use a pressure cooker to understand that could it be that God is really using some of the pressure you're experiencing in your life. When you can, this, this, look, he said, count it all joy. What we're going to walk out of here with after the next few weeks is we're going to be able to look at challenging situations and still smile, look at some difficulty and still give God glory, look at some people that don't work well with us and be like, this is all the process. I can handle the pressure 
because it's creating a wholeness in me. But the other reason Jacob writes this is because he understands he's writing to a demographic of people who are experts at living a fragmented Christianity. So he's trying to get them to a position of wholeness because he understands they're really good at singing songs. They're just really not good at serving people. He knows they're really good at shouting. That is, they're really not good at saving. Because that's a biblical principle too. Okay, I was going to tell you. He knows they're really good at being happy on Sunday. They're just really not good at being holy on Wednesday. And so what he's advocating for is a wholeness about our experience. Because we all know fragmented Christians whose praise don't match their post. We all know fragmented Christians whose lifestyle is inconsistent with their language. And this is what James is trying to warn us against. I want you to go through some tests and struggles so that the other side of you is a whole version of what God has created and not a fragmented identity. Can I be honest with y'all? I believe with all my heart that this is what people are looking for in the world. They're wondering how many of us can live a fulfilled Christian experience. I can't tell you how many Christians I talk to are unfulfilled. And I just wonder, if you always unfulfilled, why should I serve the God you serve? So he's saying maybe, maybe there's some fulfillment issues, and you've been okay just being a functioning Christian. But this is the year I want you to move from just saying it functions to it's full and filled. Here's the second one, though. He challenges the way we experience pressure. We're going to talk about that over the next two weeks. But then also, he's going to challenge the way we express value. Oh, boy. He's going to challenge the way we express value. Jacob is writing, and then we skip to verse 9. Look at verse 9. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 says this, NIV. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation. Now, I want to be very clear. He's not specifically saying that they should be humiliated. When you study it in all the translations, which we'll do in the weeks to come, you'll find that what he's really advocating for this passage is this. If you are a person who doesn't have a lot of resources, be okay when God creates opportunities. In one translation, he says, cheer for those who get a breakthrough. Y'all cry. But then he says, watch this, he says, but then if you are a person of wealth or resources, you should also be okay when you are humbled. Because there are moments in all of our lives, where, can we all be honest, when you've had a little bit of success, it's difficult to fail again. And Jacob understands the temptation that comes with success. He says when people become successful, when people are prosperous, when people get some money, when people move into a certain neighborhood, when people can buy a certain car, now they find themselves never want, then they get more and more and do more and more and post more and more and they forget. So he says to them, be okay with being humble since they will pass away. Talking about their resources like a wildflower. Verse 11. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. And in the same way, the rich, talking about their resources, will fade away even while they go about their business. Here's the big idea that Jacob is going to start wrestling with as he goes through 2 through 5. That money is not the only thing that matters. That status is not the only thing that matters. That resources is not the only thing you need. And here's why that is significant. Because if you are to live a wholehearted Christian experience, you need to understand this, that many of us don't express value correctly. Let me go here. Because value is expressed or identified by our investments. I'm going to say it again. Our values are identified by our investments. Our time, money, energy, and promotion are the greatest indicators of what matters most to us. Say it one more time. Our time, our money. Our energy and promotion are the greatest indicators of what matter most to us. If you're going to have a successful 2020, if you're going to have the year where you're not just going to be a halfway Christian but a wholehearted Christian, not just a functional one but a fulfilled one, you need to understand that you have to create some continuity between your verbiage and your values. 
between your rhythm of life and your values, between your habits and your values. I had a friend that kind of helped me to recognize this one day several years ago. Uh, I, I, was, I was talking to one of my line brothers who uh, is one of my, my good friends, but we live a very, very, very different life. Uh, very different life. And, uh, and I love him. He loves me, but we just, you know, we, we, you know, we just live a different life. And so, so one day we talking, one day we talking, and because our lives are so different, I had a little self-righteous moment. Can I be transparent with you? I had a little self-righteous moment. He was call, talking to me on the phone, and he said, Vernon, man, I just want to let you know, bro, like, I love you, and we're friends, but I've been disappointed in you lately. And I was like, in me? <laughs> I was like, I, this is how you get yourself righteous. Now, I am a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I preach and proclaim the word of God. I am a living testimony. What do you mean? You're disappointed in me. What you got to be disappointed with me about? And he says this to me. He says, Vernon, I've known you all these years, and I've known how long you and Ashley have been together, and I've seen the miracle of your kids and, and the fact that they told y'all y'all would never have kids, and you got these two kids, and it's just crazy to me that you post about everything else happening in your life, but you don't post your wife. And you don't post your kids. And you don't post your family. And when you talk to us, you say they're what you value most. But I can't tell by what you promote. I can't tell by how often you home. I can't tell by the habits that you have in your life. And as I sat in silence on the other end of the phone, I was challenged to take inventory of did my values, could someone confirm my values by my lifestyle? As you prepare for your year, I just believe that Jacob is going to apply some pressure to your life and cause you to take inventory of do your life, life hood, lifestyle and habits match your values? I had to take inventory three years ago, and I wanted to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I am doing some things that are not in alignment with my values. There's some of you in this room, you're always too tired to play with your kids when you get home. And the question I would ask you is, are they your value? That's what people saying. I just can't make time to go out to dinner. I just can't make time for a date with this significant other. I can't make time for this relationship. Okay, cool, but just don't say you value it then. There's some of us who say we value the kingdom of God, yet we don't give to it. But I do know what you value, because you got a new car when you didn't need one. Got a new outfit on every week when you didn't need one. You got all the Jordans, Space Jams, Breads, everybody, all of them. One, two, 17, 24, you got all of them. Flu Jordans, healthy Jordans. <laughs> You got healthy and flu. You're good. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I got me a little pair of space jam too. Amen. God's good. <laughs> I'm just suggesting that the way you express your value should be evident in where your time goes, where your money goes, where your energy goes, and where your promotion goes. For some of you, I believe God will convict some of you in the year to come to be like, man, I am promoting all of this other stuff. I'm reposting people I don't even know, and then I won't celebrate my own friends when they have accomplishments. But I say I value them. Some of us are going to say, hey, man, I'm investing all this money, and when I really took inventory of where I was putting my money, I recognized what I was valuing status and appearance and likes and others' opinions, and I just need to make a different type of investment. There's some of us who say we value our kids, yet we buy new clothes before we invest into a 529. Values. And so Jacob says, I want you to have a different perspective about Rich and poor, money, it withers, but values should stay the same. Here's the third thing, third thing, third thing, I got to move. Third thing that Jacob applies a little pressure to is the way we embrace self-control. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Here we go. All right. Let's go to verse 19. I need security to be ready to escort me out after this one. Ain't nobody going to like me. Here we go. Y'all ready? 
Verse 19. We're going to read through this chapter today. Watch this. Verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Oh, boy. Say it one more again. Everyone, you got to say it like I'm at home. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Some of us can live off of 19 and 20 for the first year, uh, month of the year. All you need is January to focus on this. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and stop becoming angry. That's three points right there in the close. <laughs> Verse 21. Therefore, get rid of all the moral filth and evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not li merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word who does not do what it says is like someone who looks at a face in the mirror and after looking at themselves goes away and immediately forgets what they look like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Watch this. And those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Hello, good people. I came to let 20 people know today. Could there be some areas where religion is worthless? It's a challenge. Challenge becomes there's some self control that we are rejecting. There is some self control that we are avoiding. And James will articulate several expressions of self control, but he starts with taming of the tongue. He says, Hey, look, if you really want a religion that is valued by God, you need to learn how to control what you say. Here's why. Because the greatest testament of our Christianity is consistency in character. Consistency creates confidence. I'm going to say it again. Consistency creates confidence. Here's what I genuinely believe. This is why the church is struggling in today's day and age. Are you ready? Here's what I believe. Because we know too many Christians who have inconsistent lives. We know too many Christians who say one thing and live another. And the challenge becomes if we want a wholehearted Christianity, wholehearted devotion, wholehearted life committed to God, and what it means to walk in the way that God designs and designates, we have to understand that there is a self-control that should be applied to our lives. There should be a discipline that accompanies our discipleship. Say that word again, cuss word, 2020. Here it is. You ready? There should be a discipline that accompanies our discipleship. As we walk through these next six or seven weeks, you're going to be stretched and some pressure is going to be applied to some disciplines of your life. We're going to talk about self-control in your health, health and wellness and in your eating. We're going to talk about self-control in your financial stewardship. We're going to talk about self-control in your tongue. How about, how about, how many people know that when you're in a relationship with somebody or in a marriage with somebody, you're not supposed to say whatever you want to say whenever you feel like it. And some of us are like, I'm just waiting on the key for my marriage to go to the next level. Jacob said, it ain't no problem. It's simple. Just get to the point where you are quick to listen, slow to speak, and stop getting angry all the time. But, I, but they just say stuff to me to make me mad. No problem. Then we're going to talk about what does it mean to experience stress and trial and count it all joy. Because Jacob is trying to help prepare our lives with practical wisdom that can sustain us for an eternity. But we have to embrace self-control. Here's the last one. Here's the last one. Jacob is going to apply some pressure to this last area. He's going to apply pressure to the way we empower others. Going to apply some pressure to the way we empower others. Because compassion is at the core of a Christ-led life. Say it again. Compassion is at the core of a Christ-led life. Here's why. We preach the loudest with our hands, habits, and our hearts. 
We preach the loudest with our hands, our habits, and our hearts, okay? Not our posts. Not what you reshare. Not what scripture you quote. Not what song you know. We preach the loudest with the way we live. Why? Because the way we live confirms the one we worship. And you cannot worship Jesus and follow the ways of Jesus and not care about those in need. You cannot worship Jesus and not care about those who are disenfranchised. You cannot love Jesus and follow Jesus and not care about the marginalized. You cannot care about Jesus and not care about liberation. You cannot follow Jesus and not worry about those who need food and living in food deserts. You cannot effectively articulate the gospel of Jesus without seeing him care about those in need. It's in the scripture, last verse, last verse. We're going to finish chapter 1 today. Y'all ready? Last verse, verse 27. Here it is. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and the widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. When we look at this in a few weeks, we're going to look at James chapter 2 and how Jacob encourages us to understand that our faith should always be in action. That it's not an authentic faith because you said it. He even goes on to say in, in James 2, <laughs> just to give you some foreshadowing, he says literally that, that a whole bunch of people who don't believe in God know how to quote scriptures. He said what sets you apart is how you care and serve those who need it most. And as we prepare for a year of promise and potential and productivity, I want you to understand today that the pressure that will be applied from the next six or seven weeks out of the teaching of the book of James, it's going to deal with some pressure points to the way you discipline your life, some pressure points to the way you steward, the pressure points to the way you talk, pressure points to the way you live. But here's what I can promise you. You'll be better you'll be whole and more integral on the other side. So I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to encourage you to take a challenge to walk a new way in 2020. I'm going to implore you to just give this a shot. 